Afternoon, everybody. We're going to uh, talk to you briefly about some combine servicing stuff. We're going to be really quick. Uh, first thing we're going to get into is auger finger timing on the pickup heads of the combine. Adjusted with this coupler right here. You can see this guy is just about maxed out in the slots, although the timing is correct. So have a look at yours. If you are seeing it maxed out in the slots, it's a good idea to check it. When the fingers are in the eight o'clock position, so when we walk around the back side of the head, we walk around this back side of the header over here, you can see we have this finger in the eight o'clock position. We want that flush with the edge of the auger. This one's pretty good, it's pretty close. It's not perfect, but it's, it's damn close. So just something to watch out with your pickup head. If those fingers aren't set correctly, what you'll get is you'll start to see material start to wrap up over top of the auger. So it, it picks it up and flips it up between the auger and the feeder chain on the combine. I'm um, going to talk about the front drum. Uh, Louis already uh, talked about the feeder chain. Uh, the front drum and support arms, uh, just a quick check. Uh, do any of you guys have a loony? Any of you guys have a loony? I want it back to. Oh, well, actually, fine, then I'll just use my loony. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you take a loony and you put it right in behind the front face of the drum, you should be able to fit it in and slide it up and down. And that way you know that the bearing and the support arm are still good. If the bearing is starting to fail, the uh, gap will get very small and you won't be able to fit your loony in there. Uh, up at the top of the feeder chain, of course, we have our top sprocket. Uh, the top sprocket, like Louis is saying, um, has a serial number on it. Also, if it has two grease circs, um, just by spinning it over, you'll be able to know that then you can grease that uh, every 100 hours to keep the splines lubricated as well. Stripper plates up there on those top sprockets so they look like this right here. Basically, we want one millimeter of clearance between that stripper plate and that top sprocket. What you'll find over time is this groove will wear in right here and these plates will actually bump into the sprocket. You may have to take a grinder, you might have to grind a little bit of this off so we get that clearance in here to strip the material off of those, off of those sprockets. So just something to keep in mind. Um, they, do, they do wear, um, it might even be a good idea to replace them yearly kind of thing, but, but just make sure you're getting that one millimeter clearance both between the sprocket here, the bar of the sprocket, and the sprocket tooth in the slot. That's just hardened steel is all it is. Yeah. Yeah, the question, the question was, is Sorry. what is the plate made out of? And, and it, is, it is a harder steel, it's not just mild steel. So of course, a couple of quick checks just when you're you know, getting the combine ready to go. Uh, with this feeder house down on the ground, so if you had the, the pickup header on just all the way down on the ground, there's no oil capacity, uh, sight glass right there, make sure that is full. And you can check the oil capacity of this gearbox up here. Now this gearbox, you can see in this area has a big clutch. And every year before you start combining, it's important to change that oil to uh, get rid of all the uh, the fibers and metal that have uh, you know, worn off with the slipping of the clutch when it does slip. Uh, one of the overlooked things, of course, on this drive shaft, you can see we got this little cover moved down, is that there is a grease circ here. And that is a 300 hour grease circ, or basically once a year. And just grease it, uh, you know, four or five shots, no need to grease it until grease comes out the top or it just makes a mess. Um, the same time, up here, it's kind of hard to see there is also a slip joint up underneath this cover. Uh, you can probably get it from the bottom easier. We took off this cover to try and illustrate it, but it didn't really help. Uh, that again is 300 hours, uh, basically once a year. Just give it four or five good shots. Uh, in here are the two pillow blocks for the shaft support. Those are important to get a couple shots every 100 hours. And when we're talking about grease for our case combine, it's really important that you use a lithium-based grease, uh, not molly. Uh, lithium grease is meant for high speed bearings. Uh, do not over grease the bearings. Don't pump them until you hear stuff squishing out. That's over greased. Let's continue on a little bit farther back. One of the overlooked oil capacities is the unloaded gearbox. This should be changed hopefully yearly, but if not every couple of years. There's a sight glass on the inside. 
Another good thing to look for is a, a mirror, just to check that sight glass every once in a while, just make sure the oil's not getting milky. Uh, if the oil's getting milky, that means that there's water getting into it, which means we have a, we have a problem with the seal in the top of that gearbox. One of the questions in the question queue was uh, grease intervals on their 9250 combine. This sticker right here gives you that entire interval. So um, doesn't matter what model of the combine is, there is your, your grease interval sticker basically located at the battery box. Um, again, like Steve mentioned, a couple shots for the chopper bearings, the rotor bearings. Make sure you're not over greasing because over greasing will damage a bearing just as much as, as under greasing will as well. Uh, the other 300 hours that's kind of hidden is right here on the drive shaft. Again, we got the shield taken down, just right there. Um, on the grease chart, there's always showing something up on the unloading auger area. That is for the older combines where they had this, the tensioner over here with the spring gauge. Uh, that was just for greasing the slide. It's not on this combine. It's only for the older 20 series combines, basically. Um, like Vic mentioned, chopper bearings. Two shots every 100 hours. Do not over grease, or yeah, you will probably have seal failure and some chopper issues. The rotor bearing is 600 hour interval, but that is just basically two shots once a year. Do not over grease it. Yep. I'm just going to touch base on this belt right here. This is an important one. So this one runs your shaker shoe, all right? And the tensioner can get sticky with these over time. Sitting over winter, you get some moisture in there, that sort of thing. I like to grab that belt and I like to give it a good shake, make sure that tensioner is moving. The other thing to watch with this belt over the years is this belt actually tends to wear out before it actually ever breaks, all right? So as, as the, the belt narrows, it'll sit further and further down in the pulley and when it reaches the bottom of the pulley, it will start slipping, right? So the cleaning shoe has to slip 20% before the alarm will come on. You could be slipping 10% right here and never have an alarm. You're basically losing 10% of your cleaning shoe capacity because it's slipping a little bit. So something to keep in mind with that belt. Make sure that belt's always in good shape. Um, when it comes to the hydraulic oil filters on the combine, um, me being a little bit inner retentive, I really recommend you just change them once a year. Uh, three oil filters. We have our um, hydraulic return filter, our control pressure charge filter, very important. And up above that is the lube filter, a little bit harder to see. But just up here, not too, too hard to reach, but it will make a little bit of a mess. Um, definitely, like I said, recommend changing them every year. That's uh, cheap maintenance. Uh, keeps the hydraulic system running a little cooler. Uh, of course, chopper belts right here. Um, I don't know if Louie talked about it. Proper tension on all these belts is all they need to be. There's no reason to over tighten them, like this one is slightly. Uh, the high-speed chopper belt will transmit 130 horsepower. If you are slipping a high-speed chopper belt, uh, you're using too much horsepower. Obviously your crop is not ready to go, or maybe you're just gonna have to chop or drop the counter knives to get through that field. Similar, similar to Louis's comment about the, the feeder chain tension. So very important, if you put a new belt on that chopper, get out and check it regularly, especially with the newer Kevlar style belts. I've noticed within the first 20 minutes that, that spring gauge will have extended a half an inch. So it's, it's stretched quite a bit. Um, right off the bat. So those first couple hours, get out and check it regularly. Nothing worse than, than blowing a, a new belt because you failed to, to retension it. You don't have to change the, sorry, the, the question is, uh, should we change the oil every year as well? Um, according to the operator's manual, you are supposed to. That is a yearly service. Um, most people, I recommend every two years, uh, there's quite a few times that there's been people running for four years on the oil. It doesn't hurt, but they've always been changing the filters. Of course, on our spreaders on the back here, uh, of course, people keep talking about the spread pattern on a case combine. Yes, it does fall short a little bit times, but also we also got to make sure these whale tails back here, as we affectionately call them, are in the right position. 
Over time, the whale tails that are mechanically adjustable can move. They can vibrate and uh, get into a different position so then you have too much material coming out the center area. Uh, this whale tail assembly itself on the old models can actually be adjusted up for a little bit better control. It, it closes the gap between the uh, impellers and the, the whale tail. Uh, of course on that, if you get into some really wet, yucky barley straw, then of course then you can actually start getting this plugging, right? So that is just kind of helping you spread the, the dry, uh, finely chopped materials out a little bit. That is not for wet, yucky uh, straw. One last thing to touch on while we're back here. Louis talked about an automated combine and how we have pressure sensors and the competition doesn't have that. As far as maintenance goes on those pressure sensors, if you're in really green sticky canola, make sure you clean the sensor off. It's a bit tough to see with the camera, but it'll be located inside on the sieve rail, just inside over here. So make sure you clean those sensors off. A little, a little brush will, will wipe them off. The other thing to make mention of is, is if you're washing your combine, make sure you don't spray water inside those sensors, okay? Put some duct tape over top of the sensor, and then if you need to wash in there, by all means do so. Let me get you to kick that door open. No, they're in the sieve rails. Like uh, Vic was talking about the shoe drive on the other side. Um, of course, this is the tailings processing unit. This is the drive belt for it. Tension is kind of hidden up inside a little bit. You best to get it from the inside of the uh, elevator. Um, if this does get loose, hopefully what will happen first is this pulley will slip and you'll get a warning in the cab saying that your tailings processing speed is low. Um, if that does not happen, what can happen, of course, is that you will start getting a shoe alarm saying that the shoe speed is low and it's actually the belt slipping on this pulley or the drive pulley up top and it's not actually spinning the shoe fast enough. So again, um, basically daily or every two days, just check your belt tensions. Uh, chain tensions, of course, the chain up here is the bubble up auger chain. It's a uh, tensioner you actually have to move with a wrench. Um, this, that chains the bubble up drive chain. There's another chain up top for the elevator drive. Those two chains are a 60 heavy chain. I just recommend changing them every year. Don't worry about greasing or oiling them. They're a pain in the butt to do that in the first place. And just uh, the yearly change helps keep the sprockets in good condition as well. They don't get worn out. Okay, uh, in behind here, of course, is our, our moisture bypass unit. And we took the, ooh, this is tight. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, this one's not coming out. Um, I was going to show you the, this uh, moisture bypass unit. The auger is actually still full of grain, and we were going to see what kind of grain it was, but it is actually stuck on there really well, so we're not going to do that. Uh, but of course, if you do see material in this, Lou was talking earlier about the little 5 amp fuse that is on the harness. It's right back here. Um, inside this assembly, there is a proximity sensor that senses when the grain is full and it will turn on the auger to uh, take the old material back to the elevator and let new material in. Um, that sensor, depending on the age of the combine, uh, sometimes will get um, a little less sensitive. And when you're in wheat, barley, and uh, you know, higher moisture canola, it will work just fine. Uh, but when you get into the really dry canola down around that 6, you know, 5%, it'll stop working. And, and actually there is a, an adjustment procedure that the uh, service department can do to uh, make that sensor start working properly again. It's not something I recommend people going in there playing with unless they know exactly what they're doing or they're needing to buy a new sensor. This is not where a panel goes. I guess we'll probably run it over. Um, talking earlier about uh, deslugging the combine, and Louis was talking about doing things from the cab. If after you have a really hard uh, plug going in the combine and you've taken a long time to uh, get that slug out, maybe just come over here and just double check the pivot bolts on the concave. Make sure these haven't broke. Um, they are a bolt with two washers that capture a, a spacer in there. So it should be loose. But of course, if one of these bolts with the force breaks off, you will lose that support on that 
concave assembly and it won't have the proper pinch point anymore. Sunnybrook concaves. Mm -hmm. Question from the live crowd came up where exactly the sieve pressure sensors are. So uh, camera guys, I'm gonna get you to come in from the other side. I'm gonna go in this side. I'm gonna shine my, my phone flashlight in there. Right there. So right where my finger is, you stick mm. your head in there, okay? okay? That's the sieve pressure sensor right there, okay? There's mm -hmm. one above the top sieve, and there's also one above the bottom sieve on Down both middle. sides. Okay. okay. On both sides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're monitoring both sides. That guy right there. So again, duct tape, when you're washing in there, or if you've got really green sticky canola, it'll actually kind of get coated. Again, it's an air pressure sensor, right? So you just take a soft bristle, bristle brush and you, you brush the green stuff off. Mm -hmm. Those are those brown things, they're little filters over top of the air, of the air tubes. Good. Uh, just probably the last little point we have, of course, Louis was talking about uh, feeder chain tension here. Uh, my quick check is just to make sure you can actually move the bolt. If you can grab it and move it, you know that the spacer is not captured. Uh, but doing header height calibrations, sometimes the calibration will, will fail because I mean, the header height sensors are working properly. What's wrong? This sensor, which is our feeder house position sensor, sometimes can get a little seized over the years and not move properly. If you just take this off and take it apart, you can get all the material that's built up over the years out of there. It'll probably start working properly. Then your header height calibrations will uh, start working again. Steve, uh, this, uh, what do you call this here? Feeder adapter plate? Yes. If a guy doesn't want to change it from draper to pick up better, what's the best position to have it in rut like this? Well, this year, uh, most years, the crop around here, of course, we, is nice and tall. We've never changed. We've never yeah. done that. Um, I'm going to say just let's leave it here for now. Uh, if your crop is only this tall, then we may have to put this forward. Uh, of course, like Lou was saying, just to, to eliminate this dead area between the feeder chain and the auger, just to try and get that a little bit smaller. And then when oh, we go to the, you know, we, we tip it this way and it puts the bottom of this feeder plate in closer. Okay. So it actually makes that gap smaller. So that actually works really well uh, for doing that. Um, like I said, in most crops, we haven't had to do that. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's all it does is close it again. Yep. Oh. Yep. I thought you could probably lower the header down a little bit more. That can too, but that's not going to close in this gap and cause the back feeding issue. Yeah. Good. All right, uh, that is all the time we have for our maintenance walk around. We're going to uh, send it back to Chad Moskal and the live early bird draw.